I was going to ask us to say a big, warm Portland welcome to Kiese Lemar. <laughs> Can we do that one more time? A big, warm welcome. <laughs> <laughs> For real, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And now there's a very awkward two minutes where I tell you what you're doing here and then we start talking. So I, let me just say my name's Adam Davis and on behalf of Oregon Humanities, I want to say a huge thanks for coming out tonight and I want to say a huge thanks, Kiese, for coming across the country and for the work you do, uh, the writing, everything. We are in the midst of a series exploring people, place, and power. That's what this Consider This series in 2022, 2000, 2023 is about. And there's nobody uh, that we've come across who explores that more powerfully than Kiese. And so we were really excited with the help of the Lyceum Agency to be able to make this happen. Um, yeah. There are many people in the room, which is exciting. There are also people online, and I want to say thanks for, for piping in that way. And I should say that when, here's the layout of the evening. We're going to talk for about an hour. We're going to invite questions from you from a microphone over there, which will be lit up later, for about half an hour. Then Kiese will be up front signing some books. We hope many of you will stay and talk to each other and to people you, nece you didn't necessarily come in with about some of the ideas that come up. And folks online, uh, there's going to be a facilitated follow-up conversation. My colleague at Oregon Humanities, Roselle Medina, will be facilitating that conversation. And the link to join is in the YouTube comments. Um, I want to say a couple thanks. And then I want to ask a couple questions to the audience to help give you a sense of the room. And then we'll jump in. <laughs> OK. I like that laugh. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Oregon Cultural Trust, the Susan Hammer Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation, Tonkin Torp LLP, and especially Anna Sortoon, and the City of Portland's We Are Better Together program. I also want to say thanks to so many people that are here who support Oregon Humanities, who participate in programs, lead programs. Uh, it's how the work happens. And just want to say a real big thanks. Um, so maybe can we take a minute and thank those organizations and people? <laughs> All right, couple quick questions which I will encourage you to respond to with noise. If this is your first Oregon Humanities, consider this event. Could you make a little noise? Thanks for being here, that's nice. If you have been to more than one of these before, could you make a little noise? <laughs> we hope you will all come back, so thank you. Thanks for being here. Second question, there are only two more, but they get a little more complicated. This question is based on a character in Long Division. Uh-oh. Yeah, <laughs> so if when you walk into a room, you scan that room, for people who are your people. Can you make a little noise? Woo, woo. Woo, woo. <laughs> Last one, maybe, maybe a little more complicated too. Uh, if you have strong feelings, strongly positive or strongly negative or strongly both, about the place where you're from, could you make a little noise? that orient you to what we got going on here? Absolutely. And I also want to say thank you. Um, thank you all for, for making space to meet it for me tonight. Um, often when I do talks, I have to decide before I talk whether I want to be invited back. <laughs> and I can just tell you from this vibe, I definitely won't be invited back. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to try to be uh, as honest and, and soulful as I can be but I'm also gonna try to not leave a lot of mess for y'all to clean up. Because that's how you don't get invited back to places. We, in, we can take it. it, absolutely. Okay, okay, okay. Exactly. We, we invited you in part for the mess, and you say, and you said you wanna be honest, but you also say in a couple of places in your books, you encourage, you say you're gonna try to be as honest, as generous, 
and as tender with each other as we can be. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this isn't where I was going to start, but because of what you just said, I think uh, usually we think of honesty as uh, something that's prefaced by the adjective brutal. Right. So how do you put honest with tender? You work. And, and, and I think, um, I don't remember the first time I wrote those two words together, but you know, writers have all of these little like, many epiphanies. But the first time I wrote those two words together, I was definitely on some like, that don't work. You know, like, w what is tender honesty? I mean, this was a long, long time ago. Um, and I don't like to talk in fortune cookie messages. <laughs> and I was just about to. Um, <laughs> So I'll try to be messy and not be clean. But but so 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 for me, it's it's just. Uh, <laughs> I, I think sometimes making honest proclamations can run counter to like taking care of your insides, and and what I often want to do is like uh, tell myself, remind myself that when I am being quote unquote honesty or searching for honesty or being you know nudging people to look toward what we might consider truth or honesty, um, I think it's most important that we do that um, with a tender. Uh, disposition and, and a care for ourselves. But I also don't think that that care means that we don't need to push and be pushed. So I'm just saying I think it's contradictory, but mm -hmm. so is cool. life. So. Great, so is life, yeah. so there we go. Yeah. And, maybe, and maybe so is Mississippi, and maybe so <laughs> is Oregon. And I know you write a lot about Mississippi, and I hope we're gonna talk a lot about Mississippi, and I hope here, uh, we're also thinking about Oregon or wherever it is that we come from and the nation. Uh, it feels like a lot of what you're writing about when you write about Mississippi is, uh, it's not just a place, some ideas, some people. And so I, I guess I wanted to ask early on, like when did you start to realize that Mississippi meant something to you? Man, let me tell y'all a story for you. Bruh, this dude called me on the phone like last week <laughs> with this same voice. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> and, and, and started talking about In Vogue. They don't even know who the fuck we talking about. Like, Outkast. And I, and I told my people, I was like, man, I can't wait to see who this white boy is. <laughs> <laughs> this motherfucker smooth up in here. <laughs> no, 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 no. We so gotta get back to that. Just say that before we start. We gotta get back to the honesty. Hey, hey, you said honesty. Um, <laughs> uh, Mississippi. You want to talk about? Yeah, let's talk about Mississippi. When did you know Mississippi mattered to you? Meant something to you? Oh man. Um. I, I, yeah, I, I won't be too long-winded, but you know, my, my mother uh, had me when she was 19. She was a, a student at Jackson State University. My father was 20. He was in this uh, organization called Republic of New Africa. And I just had young parents who attempted to make me understand the importance of Pan-Africanism, right? So I understood the importance of the continent and parts of our relationship to the continent. Um, you know, my mother would have freedom fighters over from Zimbabwe mm -hmm. often. So it wasn't until I was probably like 11 when I started to give my state the same attention that I had been given mm -hmm. to like Pan-Africanism, as, even as a young person, because that's what my mama drilled into me. So I think when I was like around 11 or so, um, my mother didn't let me read these books. She didn't let me read black books in my house because she thought reading white books would protect me. Um, and then I remember reading a book, ironically, about this dude, David Dennis Sr., who is David Dennis Jr., my friend's father, and a lot of work that they'd done around Freedom Summer. And so when I started to understand that, like, my getting an education in Mississippi was, like, a death-defying, like, radical, revolutionary thing as a 12-year-old, 11, 12-year-old, that's when I started to understand that, like, Mississippi meant something different. You know what I'm saying? The might of Mississippi. And that, and at that point, you know, I knew Jackson was the blackest place that I'd ever known. I knew Mississippi was the blackest state in the union, but I didn't really know what that, what that meant to the rest of the world. And I also didn't know why the white people, when I was 12 or 11, were so adamant that, that those people who had less 
would continue to have even less. Mm -hmm. And so like when I started to understand that shit and, and I started to see the history of Mississippi fully, I started to really start to appreciate like the geography of Mississippi. That's probably around 13 or 14. And then I did that thing where when you become educated, you use that education as a shield. You start trying to act like your fucking place is the best place ever. I did that for like two decades, you know what I'm mean? saying? <laughs> I started telling everybody in New York, man, fuck your borough, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> motherfucker, do y'all have rivers in this mother? And they'd be like, that's the Hudson. And I'd be like, but is it the New York River? Cause we got a Mississippi River. You know, like you just start being <laughs> mad reactionary <laughs> to everything. And, and it's easy to be reactionary about Mississippi because across the world, like if you know about Mississippi, most people often know it as some place that lacks. Mm. And I just wanted people to be like, if you think Mississippi lacks as the blackest station and blackest state in the nation, I feel like you're saying the black folks in Mississippi lack. Mm. And I'm trying to be like, well, we don't. You know what I'm saying? Or we do, but we don't lack any more, any more differently than you do. So that's a long-winded answer. But yeah, it was probably on 13 or 14 for me. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel like a long-winded answer at all, and it feels like it's a start. Yeah. Uh, in part because it feels like talking about Mississippi is talking about the country, and it's talking about race, uh, talking about class, too. Um, there's a, the epigraph to heavy is t from Tony Cade Bambara. Mm -hmm. um, an author who, among other things, has a short story collection called Gorilla, My Love, and there's mm -hmm. a story in that called The Lesson. And you refer to Bambara a lot as someone who was formative for you. There's a character in The Lesson, Miss Moore, mm -hmm. like this informal teacher. Yep. Who the narrator, Sylvia, says, Miss Moore's always saying, where we are is who we are. Right but it don't necessarily have to be that way. Yeah. And I just wonder, like, Sylvia's recounting right. of Miss Moore's comment, where we are is who we are, but it don't necessarily have to be that way. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, first of all, I want to say, if you haven't read Bambara um, and you profess to like a short story, I don't really know if you've read short stories. Like, Bambara in The Lesson and other pieces in Gorilla My Love, like, taught me what was possible uh, with what we call the short story. Mm -hmm. but, but that quote is, is tough because like when I, when I read that quote and when I reread that quote and when I hear it, I almost hear it as like implicitly in a pot, like sometimes some of us feel like we need to apologize for where we are from. Mm -hmm. And it's coming from Mississippi, you know, like I, I've been through that stage and, and I don't think I stayed in that stage as long as other people I know. Um, but I think power tender power means you can stand in front of people outside of Mississippi and say, I absolutely grew up in a place where the water looked like mm -hmm. vegetable oil. Mm -hmm. I absolutely grew up in a place taking showers when you, when you got out, you didn't have to really necessarily put on lotion because it felt like you were taking a shower in lotion. Mm -hmm. But I also grew up in a place that literally created what y'all call civil rights. You know what I'm saying? I grew up in a place that created Fannie Lou Hamer, that created Ida B. Wells, that created Mecca Evers, that mm -hmm. created Jasmine Ward. So I feel that quote, but I feel like if you feel it too much, you can get into a place where you apologize for what people in your state did to the best people in your state. And what I want to do is live in the fucking like, like majesty of what the best people in my state did. So I feel that quote deeply, but I also just want to be able to say I'm not apologizing for what the best of Mississippi did ever outside of Mississippi, but I am, um, but I do feel responsible for some of what the worst of Mississippi has done. I, mean, I, th I think those are paradoxical, you see what I'm saying? You, feel, you said you feel responsible for some of the worst that Mississippi has Absolutely. done. How so? I'm, I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Mississippi, I mean like, I mean there's so many ways to talk about this. I can't see y'all right now, so I don't know if, <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, you definitely, you definitely here. I, I can't tell who or what kind of folks are here. So, so maybe, maybe that's for the best. But, but, but I, but I, but I think like, I think that um, you know, bro, bro, like before, before the pandemic, I would, I would go into like these juvenile detention centers in Jackson, my my city. <laughs> I remember one time, last time I was there with my friend Ryan Mack, we grew up together. Um, Ryan taught me how to be an artist. Among other things, Ryan went to prison for a little while. And we went to this place to talk, and then the kids were talking to us, and this one kid was like, um, he asked Ryan what he did to get in, and Ryan was like, you know, I shot somebody. And then the kid was like, how many people you shot? And then Ryan didn't want to say, and then Ryan eventually said, 
And then the kid was, but then Ryan's whole point was like, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you cannot carry a gun in Jackson, Mississippi after you get arrested because that's what I did. And then these little jokers were like, but, but this Jackson. And you can say I didn't fail, but I'm a fucking writer who writes every single day of my life to young people in Mississippi. Mm. So I think one of the problems we have in my state, maybe in Portland, definitely in the nation, is that we kind of don't want to take responsible for any fucking failure. You know what I'm saying? And so like, I can be like, oh, I wrote a fucking book called Heavy. I wrote a book called Long Division. I wrote some blah, blah, blah. I'm in Portland. People come out here and clap for me. I'm very, very thankful. But I'm under no illusion that like my art has done what I wanted it to do. Because if my art did what I wanted it to do, that little motherfucker wouldn't even be in prison. That little motherfucker wouldn't even be talking to us about guns, what, what, like how you have to have a gun. And so that does not mean you need to take all of this on your back. But I think it's, it's, I think it's much more important that we sit in the failures sometimes of our art with the expectation that we can revise that failure into something else. And for me, I'm definitely in here fucking responsible for Mississippi. I went to school with the mate, with the governor. I went to school with Tate Reeves. Mm -hmm. I didn't bust that motherfucker in his face. <laughs> I'm responsible for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's true. I hope y'all recording it too, because that's true. So I'm just saying, like, you know, it, it's not even, yeah, we're responsible. I mean, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't pass the last bill that, like, <laughs> Like, they wouldn't let poor people, like, not pay their water bill. Like, I fought against that shit diligently. Um, but we lost. So, yeah, when you lose, you're responsible. That's a big, I mean, responsible is a big word. And yeah. you just said you're in some way responsible for a governor with whom you have strong disagreements and would have liked to pop in the face. And if we bring that home to ourselves, that's asking us to feel responsible for all sorts of things we're usually better at pointing at and seeing out there. So, yeah, but that's the thing, like, I don't wanna be ableist, but like, you know, if one can point with one, like, I can point here and point there. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm pointing at two different places here, and, and if I have two hands, I'm pointing at you now, you know what I'm saying? If I do this, I'm pointing at me and you. So, so like, the notion of a pointer is, is interesting, like, yeah, point, but, but like, the thing about critique that I hear in this country is that like, even the people we pointing at, like we're not saying anything about. You know, I know we I know you don't want to talk about what I'm about to say, but like, you know, Chris Rock got up on stage the other day and pointed at Jada again, because he pointed the first time. And 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 then like the point was like, you're a B word. Mm -hmm. Will, you're a B word. So, and what we didn't see was not just pointing at him, but any attempt to sit in the absolute humiliation that that very rich black man felt. And mm -hmm. so what I'm trying to say is like, I'm not trying to you know, pinpoint rock, but I'm just trying to say like, in order to point, you, you, you know, it, it doesn't take much sort of like mushiness. Mm -hmm. I, think in, I think in order to kind of point in two different ways, it, it's, it's gonna take a lot, you know what I'm saying? Cause you're gonna have to talk to people about what you think is your success. Somebody might be like, that's wrong. And you gotta talk to people about the way you fail. And I just think like we don't ask that of presidents, we don't ask that of governors, we rarely ask that of principals, we don't ask that of fucking pr uh, preachers. So every institution is hollow because we ain't asking the motherfuckers who run it, like when was the last time you failed and how? So mm. in the absence of that shit, like people can read a book like Heavy and be like, oh, da 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 da. I'm like, fam, like we live in a cauldron of fucking dishonest, like, like disaster. Mm. <laughs> and so like, I just think maybe if we took responsibility for what that means, but I don't think take responsibility for what that means is a speech act. Yeah. I think it might begin with a speech act, but I think ultimately like it, it, it takes a lot of speech acts, it takes a lot of accountability, it takes a lot of failure, it takes a lot of pushing. Um, damn, I didn't want to get all heavy like that real quick, but. It's good. <laughs> I mean. Uh, what is this flower? Is this a flower up here? What is this? I don't. I, I think it's a flower. <laughs> okay. Does right. that feel? That feels like a good temporary. We'll get catch our breath. Go back to the heavy stuff. Yeah. When was the last time I failed and why? Uh, when was the last time we failed? Um, those are big, hard questions. And you said at the end of that comment, you don't think it's just a speech act. And can I can I push you a little on that? What oh, what yeah. is it beyond a speech act? I mean, it can be a speech act, but I, I, even when you said that, it's like, 
I'm, I'm really thankful to be here, and, and especially here in Portland. We maybe can talk about that later, but I'm, I'm, I'm especially happy to be here because, you know, my Lyceum family, people who I literally consider family, who are one of the reasons that people are here to see me today um, are here. Um, the Kleiners, like another group of people I consider family. Uh, Samson, <laughs> Kleiner did this dope-ass shirt. Y'all need to get one if you don't have one. Um, I'm so happy to be here. You know, uh, Tin House, uh, <laughs> the folks over at Tin House, like I, I literally wouldn't have a career I had if they hadn't given me an opportunity to come there and do my thing. Um, but like, I, you know, like I wasn't sure I was supposed to get on a plane and come here. Like mm -hmm. I, you can't tell me getting on a plane to come here was the ethical thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it, it wasn't, but, but there was a duty and there was money on the other end. And if you take away the money, the duty don't mean shit. So I just think sometimes we need to sit in that a little bit. Uh -huh. It's hard to sit in that when you know it and you get your ass on a plane and you, five minutes later you're on the stage. You know what I'm saying? So like, I'm, 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 just, I'm just saying I, 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 I'm, I'm very thankful and very, 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 very happy to be here and be anywhere in the world people want to talk to me. But, you know, we all, we're not, we all know, like, the electricity it takes to run these mics are putting some fucking stress on somebody in the world. Mm -hmm. My coming here is putting some stress on Earth. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, 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 so I'm not saying that for, for claps. I'm just saying, like, if we really want to do that work of sitting in it, like, we kind of got to, like, maybe linger, you know, like, linger in these small steps mm -hmm. with the hope that the small steps can, like, change, I think, us soulfully. And I think if you do a soulful change, you can change the way people move in the world. But... I don't think we can even get there sometimes when we think decisions are good if we made them. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then we blame, and then we like, fuck Trump. I'm like, motherfucker, like Americans who believe that shit elected that guy. You know what I mean? Like, so, 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 I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a joyful ass dude, but I do believe what I'm saying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's part of what's, I think, compelling both in what you've been saying and what's on the page is the combination of palpable joy and a lot of humor and the, the heaviest, hardest stuff to take about what we're responsible for, complicit in. Uh, and while you were talking, it made me think of your, your grandmother, especially mm. as she shows up in, in heavy and of her commitment to Mississippi. And when you ask her, uh, why didn't you leave? Why, why do you stay? Yeah. Um, I mean, the wonderful thing I think about writing books is that you get to explore parts of your imagination and parts of your family. Sometimes you maybe wouldn't have actually like made time for it. And um, uh, I could talk forever about my granny, but then mm -hmm. I would, I would, this would be a bad talk because I would get super mushy. <laughs> and I wouldn't be able to finish sentences and shit, but um, yeah, fam. Like she's just she she is. I was about to say was, and that's what makes me not happy. But she mm -hmm. is one of those people in the world who, um, again, I won't talk about it too long. But you know, like people often talk about the Great Migration and all the people that left Mississippi to go to Indianapolis, Chicago, Detroit. Um, but also, a lot of times these people in the migration left like rural towns like Forest where my grandma and my mama grew up to go to like southern cities like Jackson or like Memphis. So, so the Great Migration was much more complicated I think than people talk about. But the thing about the migration that I think we don't sit in enough is that like that first generation of people who were left had a lot of work to do, hmm. who were left. My grandma mom was left hmm. at eight years old and, and she didn't wanna go. But there's a lot of shit my grandmama didn't want to do that her parents and parental figures and, and, and older people made. So my grandmama was able to stay in Mississippi because she was able to stay, ironically, with um, a woman that she called her mother, who I thought was my grandmother my whole life. Um, and this woman ended up uh, having a <laughs> having an <coughs> affair with her real father, who supposedly left and went up north with her actual mother. Um, so. She, she wanted to stay, like at eight years old, she was working in the fields. She tells me in the story, who knows if the story's true, but her, her story was like, I didn't want to go up north. Like, they got land up there. That's what my grandma would say, they, they got land up there? And people would be like, nah. And then she'd be like, well, what I'm going for? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then she's like, well, you know, because fucking like Jim Crow and like, you know, the, uh, some of our family is up there and they building. And then she'd be like, you know, my grandma, she real petty. She'd be like, oh, you talking about so-and-so who live in eight motherfuckers in a room? <laughs> you know? And I'd be like, and then they say, grandma be like, yeah. She's like, nah, I'm good in this little one bedroom <laughs> shotgun house, like up on cinder block. So she, when we talk about, when some of us talk about the wonder of Mississippi, like she saw that shit early. And even now, she's 94 years old, and she's at my auntie's house, and I guarantee you, she's not lucid, but when she is lucid, the thing she's gonna say is, take me home. Mm. I wanna go back to my house, to, to the house that I made for myself. So, you know, I don't have that same thing in me. Like, I left Mississippi, I mean, I didn't wanna leave, but I left when I was 20, I came back, and then just left again, you know what I'm saying? Like, we, we, we're different people in that way, but I, but, I, but I do appreciate her love and desire um, to not relinquish that which she worked for. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that, that's my grandma's shit. My grandma's shit's like, yo, I worked for this shit, fam. Like, you not, I'm not finna give this shit up to go up north to rent some house. Like that land, as fucked up as it is, that's our land. That's our land. We ain't got no land up north. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot more to that story, but that's that's why she stayed. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think she put so much of herself into it. She put so much of her life and work into it. And also, it was inherited, too. That's right. And it's so one of the things that I've been thinking about as this has been approaching is when, when does it make sense to kind of cut bait? Uh, especially because you, I think, are getting us thinking a lot about freedom. Right. And I think there's a quick take on freedom that makes it sound like we go where we want to go. But the roots, the roots here feel very strong in Mississippi, in family, uh, and your grandmother, most of all, articulating it regularly. Yeah. Like, this is the land we worked. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, that's a big question. So I, I'm not going I'm not going to attempt to answer that for everyone um, when they should cut and leave. But what, I, but what I will say is when you come from Mississippi, I was about to say a place like Mississippi, but I don't actually believe that there is a, you know, I don't actually believe what I was about to say. So uh-huh. but when you come from Mississippi, um, I, th- <laughs> I think much more than like um, sort of meditating on when you, what happens if you have to leave, I, I would much rather like for schools, and because church is so big down there, maybe churches, this is, this is utopic. This is not, <laughs> this is utopic because the shit we're looking at is dystopic, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so like, I, I, would, I, would, I would really like if um, we kind of sat down with ourselves and uh, young people in our lives and talked about what it means to give to a place and leave. Like, like, can you give to a place and mm-hmm. leave? Can you, can you give as much as you can to a place? Especially if, particularly at that time, staying in that place is destroying your heart. We all know we often, most of us die, I think, broken hearts. You know, you call it a heart attack, you call it whatever the fuck you want. But like, if, 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 if I think if, if I was taught as a young person that mobility is something that they do not want black folk to have, especially in my state, I think the flip is that we just like, so we gonna run. And not what, I, what, I, what I wish my people did a little bit more talking about was like, what happens? Can we run and tend to the place that we made? Hmm. Can you run to a different place and tend to a place? I think premature death makes this really hard because you're never given the possibility or probability that you're gonna be able to make it back home. But I, but, but I do believe that you, can, that you can leave and tend to home. And I actually think if you don't tend to home when you leave, you're gonna be passing to somebody else in them new spaces. And I think we see a lot of that shit. I see a lot of people, you know, I see, I see, I see a number of writers out there in the world who are Mississippi writers who will not say they're Mississippi writers. You know what I'm saying? Like who, won't, who, who just won't, won't say that they're Mississippi writers because of what that might mean. So my point is like, I just think we can move to the world, go wherever we have to go but creatively take home with us. And we have to decide what that means. Maybe that means you give all or half or whatever the fuck you make, blah, blah, blah. Maybe that means that you come home more often. But I think that the creativity in that question isn't even posed. And then we like lay it down to do you stay or do you leave? Mm -hmm. You can stay and hate the fucking place. 
you can leave and love it. But I don't think we really, really have done the work to like make those two texture realities hmm. kind of meet. Yeah, it's the idea of tending to home, whether yeah. you're at home or not. Uh, it, that feels like a really potent way to put it, and it does make me think a little bit about this place, too, where yeah. Oregon, Oregon is not Mississippi. It's different in lots of ways. But like Mississippi, that's a good smile. <laughs> Did I not need to say Oregon is not Mississippi? I don't know, man. <laughs> I <Is> mean, <laughs> um... <laughs> Um, I mean, listen. Yeah, we're listening. We're listening. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm all about shitting on places when I come to them. That's one of the things I'm good at. I don't know if Leslie like, knows that, but like, I, I'm really great at shitting on a place when I come. But I, like, there are few. I'm not gonna shit on Portland. I'm not gonna shit on Portland directly. I'm a, <laughs> <laughs> I'm using mad subtext through all this whole conversation, and I hope y'all feel it. But, but I will say I am I am I am grateful to be here because whatever whatever is out there or however this audience looks, I can't see shit. <laughs> you get this kind of looking audience in Mississippi, they wouldn't be up here watching me. That's real talk. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? So. Um, I'm not saying y'all need to congratulate yourselves for that, but I'm just saying <laughs> it's a little different. But y'all should come to Mississippi. You should come to Jackson to see how different it is. <laughs> Bring your own water. <laughs> well, actually thinking about the place and while you were talking and politely saying only indirect things, um, it made me think that there's actually an example here of a guy who who won't leave, even there there are other places he could go, and that's, that's Damian Lillard. Bruh, you do not want me to talk about Damian Lillard. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you. But, but... Because, yeah. if these people loved Damian Lillard the way they say they love Damian Lillard, yeah. they would be writing fucking, like, <laughs> letters begging that GM to let that brother free. Hmm. Sorry. Sorry. So if they love him like they say, they would say, go to a place where it works. If I love you, I want you to do what's in your best interest. Even though you, you, you mean with this interviewing, you make me feel good. You make me feel good. But if I know that there's other opportunities out there for you to ultimately like win, and you might be like, I don't want to go. But if I love you, I'm going to be like, man, you smooth with a motherfucker, bro. But you, you could be smoother. <laughs> <laughs> I've you never been be, called smooth before. That's the first time be, in my life. You might be smoother with the Bucks. You might be smoother with, dare I say, the Lakers. No, nobody's smoother with the Lakers. But, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like, Dame, this sounds like... Uh, so Dame actually like, grew up in California. But he has made Oregon a place that he is deeply committed to. And it, so, like, leave basketball aside for a minute to the extent that you can. He, he's, he's committed to a place in this very visible way, even though it's, the challenges are all over. And so the, the goal of excellence, it's a different kind of excellence, it seems like he's modeling. Right. I mean, I, I'm not going to, I mean, I feel like I've gone as far as I'm going to go in this. <laughs> 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 I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying that, I'm, yes, but, but what I'm trying to tell y'all, we were talking about this a, a few minutes, we were just eating some good food a few minutes ago, and, um, and the thing to me about Dame is, oh, first of all, let me say, when I came to Portland like four or five, three, three or four years ago, and I came to Sunnyside, and I hadn't, like, I, haven't, I hadn't lived in a place at that point that had a basketball team, right? I think at the time I was still at University of Mississippi. Okay. And, and full college football is the biggest thing in my state. And I, I had uh, tickets to the Grizzlies, but it was different, fam. Like, I went into that school, and, like, these, like, six-year-olds, five-year-olds, 13-year-olds, like, they was all rocking the shit, right? Like, they were, and, like, so I, I had no idea what a player could mean to the development of young people before mm. I came to Portland. And I'm saying that, even saying that, I just don't think you, you, you put your well-being in the hands often of millionaires who never had to compete. 
and the GMs and the millionaires who make the decisions about where these fucking genius black motherfuckers are gonna go and play never had to compete. Mm -hmm. So the idea, like the idea in basketball that someone who is so piss poor at their job can tell someone who literally is one of the 10 best human basketball players on earth where to go. He been here long enough, bruh. Set that motherfucker free. <laughs> Y'all know it. Y'all got a lot going on. I just had some kombucha. That shit was popping. I mean, like, you know, you got a lot going on here. Like, you know, like, and it's not working. It's not working. Let that brother go. All right, we're gonna, somebody here has a connection to Dame and to the front office, and so some, it's not me that has that connection, but someone that has it has to, has to get away to get this. Now, you referred to the University of Mississippi football team, and there's a moment in the essay uh, in, in this book, How to Slowly Kill Yourself in, and Others in America. There's an essay about your developing relationship to the University of Mississippi football team, and there's this one short line where you say, you're talking about the outcome of the game, and you say, we won, or something like oh, that, man. and then the next sentence is, we. Yeah, that's, that's uh, I mean, I, I wrote that essay for ESPN. I mean, are they recording this? <laughs> they what? Are they recording this? They are. Okay. <laughs> so somebody from ESPN, <laughs> might, might have paid me to, to write an article about Miss, Ole Miss football when I first got there that was sort of going to be like the spark that was going to send everybody. Because people, people knew that they were cheating when I, when I first got there. I don't know if you know, but this was a few years ago. And so they might have given me some money to be like, write an essay when you get there that can be the smoking gun for da-da-da-da-da. So when I got there, I started interviewing people and writing an essay, and I was just like, yo, I can't. First of all, this is Oxford, Mississippi. Like, I can't come to Oxford, Mississippi. If any of y'all know Oxford, throw the football team, which is the economic engine of that shit. And, it is, and it's mostly all black boys. Throw that football team under the bus for a $12,000 check from ESPN, when at that point, those players couldn't get a $10 check mm -hmm. from ESPN. So I literally was like, yo, I can't do what y'all want me to do. There's some fuck shit going on around here. But what I'm gonna focus on is the strange sort of like paradox of, of my being a, a visitor to Oxford, Mississippi. It's a part of Mississippi I never grew up in. I grew up in Central, not Northern. And, 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 and feeling this weird sort of like possession over these black boys, mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a similar possession that most, most of the white people in Oxford feel. And so if you really read that essay, like I'm going in, but I'm also going in on myself. Like when you just said that, I was like, God, that was so gross, Kiesa. Because there were times when I felt like we, like, you know, Ole Miss would be playing, Ole Miss would be playing football. And I call my boy Derek, uh, Derek Carell, and I'd be like, yo, how we doing? How we doing? And at the time, this fucking place had, you know, multiple con con Confederate statues on, 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 on the ground. And most importantly, y'all, like the black student athletes of that school were the economic engine of the entire town. And they were not treated that way. They were treated like fucking like niggas when they lost, and they were treated like niggas who could play football good when they won, mm. which means they were treated like niggas. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So when I wrote that piece, I was trying to just sit in that, well, one, I'm coming back to the state. I ain't been here for 10 years. I feel this weird sort of collective weeness about these young black boys making all of, making all of us happy, like raising the property value of fucking like houses and shit. Um, and I felt like they were, I mean, I felt, I got swept up in that shit. Mm -hmm. I, got, I got swept up into like the weeness of, of, that, of, that, of, that, of, that, of that institution and that football team, so. And, yeah. and, and that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing? Hell yeah, that's embarrassing, bro. Like, that school is, there's a lot of incredible people at that school, and there's a ton of phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal students who are working and trying and are, like, the best of Mississippi. But you, I'm not, you know, it, it is what it is, bro. Like, they hired a headhunter to hire fucking a new president, and then they hired the headhunter. Right. Without yes. interview, like, do you understand? Like, they, like, they hired the headhunter. That's the Dick Cheney model. That's of, the Dick Cheney model. Yeah. Right. Right. And 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 and, and this headhunter never met with with any other fucking constituents. On, so like, you know, and so really, what that means is Tate Reeves, the motherfucker I should have punched in his face when I was a goddamn C, uh, and I wasn't a C when I was a sophomore at Mississippi, 
his hand-picked IHL, which is the Board of Trustees, they decided that the fucking like headhunter was gonna be the president. And so, you know, and, and I have beef with them for, 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 for different reasons, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, they didn't, they didn't wanna pay me what I was worth. Because they can't. <laughs> 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 they can't. That was Where the camera at? Yeah. Yeah, right. There's a few. Right I like there. to look at cameras. I got kicked out of college for taking a library book from a library, and when I kicked that shit, I dropped that shit. It was Red Badge of Courage. And the camera. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> and then they called me the next day. Uh, you're getting expelled. <laughs> I got kicked out of school for that. But yeah, I do like to look in. I like to look at white people in the camera when I do fucked up shit. Okay, so there's. There's a light over there. That's what I was thinking. It was There's this a light one over this there. One. <laughs> be like, yeah. And I can't speak to who's on the other end of it, but if you want to look at them and give them that smile, that's where to look. <laughs> they, got, <laughs> they got Google, bro. We're going to floss a little bit tonight, I hope. Um, so it's inter the, the we part is interesting, and it made me think again about like that you and your grandmother, if I'm remembering right, would watch every Friday night the Dukes of Hazard. Yeah, we sure did. And so the example of you feeling like this football team, we are part of, like we're winning, or you and your grandmother watching the Dukes of Hazard, where it right. feels like there is some really complicated identity stuff going on there. The I mean, Dukes it's kinda, of Hazard. It's kind of complicated, but the Dukes of Hazard wasn't, I mean, it was complicated for my mother, who was a college professor at the time, who could talk to you about why watching the show with white boys driving a General Lee with the Confederate insignia <laughs> was the antithesis of what black people might need to be consuming. Okay. But my grandmama is a Southern black woman who was fucking hungry for any kind of Southernness mm. that was shown on TV. Same reason she liked Hee Haw, same reason she liked Dallas. You see what I'm saying? So like, like, like I, think, I think it's important to talk about this because sometimes I think, particularly talking about uh, older grandmother type figures, I think we, we make them so saccharine and making them saccharine like they're like purely saccharine. You know what I mean? My grandmother had like a, a, a racial critique. She had a gender critique. Um, she had a spatial critique. But she also found a lot of pleasure in um, Hee Haw and... Um, uh, I love that sentence in, just in, on its own. In, in, in Dallas. <laughs> but you know what else she found pleasure in? She found pleasure when she came home from work from, from fucking slicing open chickens at the chicken plant. You couldn't talk to my grandmama from 11 to 12, 15, because she was watching um, uh, Young and the Restless. Mm. And so, and so, so, look at people clapping for that. <laughs> I know there's some black people out there, too. <laughs> That's how I know black people here. Y'all just clapping for Young and the Restless. Watch this, watch this. All my children, <laughs> black folks in Portland. There we go. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 so, and so, like, there's just a complexity to me about my granny and, and, and the shit she used to watch. And then her best friend, Mama Lara, was older than her. But 10.30 uh, Saturday night, just when wrestling used to come on, I would, you know, I was like f between four and 10 years old. I'd just sprint down to my Mama Lara's house, who was slightly older than my grandmama. And we'd just sit there on some plastic fucking furniture and watch these mostly white men on steroids in tights and we would watch primarily so we could, until we could see the black men come on there with tights, Butch Reed, Junkyard Dog, and whatnot. So, so I'm just saying it's complicated. But at the same time, I just think sometimes, you know, black people get to, get to, get to in, in, in enjoy, like, 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 transgressive pleasures as well. You know what sure. I'm saying? Um, and especially older grand, uh, black women, I just think we need to, like, open up possibility for that. Mm -hmm. you, know? you describe yourself multiple times as a southern black man. Right. And it feels to me like it, it's a way of saying something that you were just talking about. Southern and black, but connected. Yeah. And I'm asking that, I'm building towards a question, or maybe it's not a question, maybe it's just a gesture in your direction. Someone that I was with last week said that she's, she's a teacher who's been doing this exercise with her students where she has them list five sort of categories that they're a part of, that are essential to who they are. Right. And then she makes them remove, one by one, the ones that aren't fundamental to who they are. Wow. And she gets them down to one. Yeah, right. It's, I, people are taking the Lord's name in vain in response to that <laughs> exercise. 
Uh, I mean, is it possible to peel apart black and southern and male, for that matter? How do you think about the way those three things go together? Change the peaks, bro. Um, <laughs> I don't like, okay, you asking me to be a person I don't like, so I'm going to be this person for like 25 seconds. Bring it, yeah. All right. I'm sorry, but, you know, words, words are approximations. Like, I don't believe anyone in the world who tells me they're a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. I, know that they're, I know that they're using what they've been given. There's no, there's no reason in the world to think that there's only two genders. Like, there's no reason in the world to think that, like, there's good and evil, right? Like, they're oh. approximations. So what I hear you asking me is, like, what approximation would I be most okay with if mm -hmm. black, uh, southern, um, man? And, and because they are approximations, I, I'm going to say black. Because I think black and, and the way we've, we've constructed that word means so, 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 so much. Mm -hmm. And I think man, which is a different word than male, mm -hmm. which is a different word than southern, I just think those approximations are like, they, they, they're just la less weighty, they're less evocative, they're less interesting. I think black, the way I think it has been constructed, mm -hmm is an amalgamation of a whole lot of shit. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's just so like, it's a words, it's approximation. Like, I, I mean, you know, you ain't gotta ever call me a man. You ain't really gotta ever call me Southern. But you don't call me black, I'm gonna feel some kind of way. <laughs> okay. With the understanding that whatever we, I mean by black, like I mean so much more. But I just think that that word, like is, is much more expansive, definitely than, than man, most definitely than male. And I think the Southern, mm. but maybe not. What was the 25 seconds that you didn't want to be? Well, because sometimes, bro, people don't want to hear you talk about how words are bullshit at, at a thing about words. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? People don't want to be reminded that we all up in here using symbols to communicate and acting like we know what the fuck other, everybody else means. <laughs> we don't know what the fuck nobody means up in here. We don't, but we, but we shake, we, you know, we act like, we gonna act like we do, so, um, but yeah. So, I'm gonna ask you about one more word, and if you don't wanna deal with the word, it's actually a word that doesn't show up in your books, as far as I can remember, but it's a word that shows up all the time in Portland, especially around race, mm. and that word is equity. And I'm curious because it's such a present word out here and I don't remember coming across it in any of these three books. And now you're shuffling in a way that makes me excited, so. <laughs> I'm, oh, um, I'm just off, I'm off, I'm, I'm, I'm very off Riddick and uh, questions that remind me of like DEI make me like, kind of make me itch. They get, the, um, they get the arthritis going? Yo, man, them equity conversations. Uh, because we're in a space now where people who don't say diversity want to pat them, not you, but people who don't <laughs> oh, say of diversity. Course. Right, 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 exactly. Not you, not you. Yeah. You too smooth for this. Uh, <laughs> people who don't say diversity often want to pat themselves, we often want to pat ourselves on the back for using equity. Like, we don't mean diversity, we mean equity. So, um... But let me just say, take the question like on face value is like, I don't know what else to say other than like, I hope equity in this community means an honest assessment at what has been given to certain people mm -hmm. and what should have been given to certain people. And, 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 and to question what, like, what it means to not be given what, you're, what, you, what, you, what you've earned and what you, what, you, what you earn and what you need for generations and generations and generations. And most important, and as importantly, think about what it means to be people who've been given way more than they actually deserve for generations and generations. I would assume equity means we look at that and we say, how do we fucking like equalize the, the distribution of resources and wealth? Mm -hmm. on, on, on the surface, that's what I assume it would mean. Mm -hmm. But because Portland, I assume, is like other places in the, in the world, you have a lot of people who say they earn some shit that they don't want to share with people who have also earned some shit. And, and, so, and so, like, I'm not coming, trying to be the person who comes to Portland trying to tell Portland about Portland, because I hate people who do that kind of shit. But, 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 but if you're asking about equity, like, I would hope that people in this community, and this is where this is hard, because I think there are a lot of people who've been who, who've been gener generationally like given shit that they might not deserve. But the question is like, how do we share? If it's material, I think it's easy. 
But I also think culturally, some of us have been given something called home training. Mm. I think we need to share that with some of these motherfuckers. You know what I mean? <laughs> but 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 conversely, like you know, like I'm I'm in a place in my life where I make for my family, I make a lot of money, mm -hmm. and I don't know what to do with that money other than to share it with people. I used to share it with slot machines. And even when I shared it with slot machines, I still was like sharing it with my granny first. Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm saying all that to say like, I don't want us to think that this equity model is, well, one, white folk, anywhere you go, owe people. They owe the people who stole, who they stole the land from and they owe black and brown folks. I don't give a fuck what you're talking about, they just do. But I also think families owe each other. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if there are, like, as someone in a family who makes a ton of money, I do have the responsibility to kind of, to not kind of, but to fucking, like, see what I can equitably share. Mm -hmm. It gets hard when you're talking about people who come from, like, s like, intergenerational poverty, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just, it's just different. Like, you, you, you know, you, 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 I don't, you know, because you can do that, you do that three months in a row, you ain't got no more money, mm -hmm. you know? So... That's a hard question to me, yeah, um, yeah. but but I do think in, in, in this community, I, I, I would hope it would mean like sharing what you have unfairly accumulated mm -hmm. with people who have also done the work to accumulate, but at the end of the day, as we know, we got to question like accumulation and extraction. We, I mean, we got to question capitalism, but you can question capitalism while like giving your shit away. Mm -hmm. It's not like we got to figure that shit out before, no, nah, motherfucker, you're like, you know, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? And then the question though was like, what, 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 then what? But I also just don't think we're just talking about capital. I don't think we, I think we're talking about culture too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a couple more questions from me and then we're gonna open that microphone over there and, uh, Maybe this is the last question that's about us. A couple of, I think, big word concepts. And this one is, I think it's putting your mother in conversation with your grandmother, which I think you do okay. around freedom, which you identify, I think, with your grandmother. Yeah. And excellence, which you identify with your mother. And yeah. even that moment when you talk about taking the red badge of courage without checking it out and looking in the camera. Felt like you were siding with your grandmother. But I want to ask you those two words, freedom and excellence, which feel like big ethical choices. Right. Freedom and excellence? Those were the words that, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so I grew up with a mama who was just like, you know, she she made you, you know, brush your teeth with excellence, gargle with excellence, <laughs> spit out fucking excellent, you know? Wipe your ass excellently, you know? And like I just I just understand who 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 was, you know, very uh clearly adamant about if you don't do such and such excellent, white people gonna get you. Now Retrospectively, she was right. <laughs> White people got me <laughs> for not being excellent, right? I should not have stolen that book, for example. But the reason they got me was because I was being like, I actually was being excellent. Like, I actually was like being excellent at 19 years old at that thing black children are very seldom allowed to be excellent at, which is experimentation. Mm -hmm. And I mean this with every fucking like shred of my being, mm -hmm. that if you do not allow young black people to experiment mm. in this nation, you are terror. Mm. You are terror. You see what I'm saying? And so like for me, you know, I was experimenting with words, writing essays and shit that people at my school didn't like and that the fraternities didn't like and then I got kicked out of school for fighting them because they didn't like something that I wrote. So my mama would say, kids say you weren't excellent. But retrospectively, like, that was that abundance, like I was, I was, you know, to experiment, you have to in some way be free, like to freely experiment. That's what I used to love so much about growing up in Mississippi, across the street from my, my grandmother's house were these woods, and, I, and, and, and lots of us used to go in those woods and experiment with our bodies, but particularly the kids that we now know were, were, were queer. Like they found spaces in those woods to freely experiment. Mm -hmm. And when they were caught, the punishment was like, like beyond anything we could ever imagine. So, Excellence is what, I'm, I feel excellence and I feel like the black excellence people and all shit, all that shit, but this shit is so narrow. Hmm. You know what I mean? It's so, so narrow. Like, and I don't think it takes much to be excellent. My mama used to always say, you gotta be 
y'all got to work twice as hard as white people to get half as much. Mm -hmm. But she never talked about what happens when you actually are twice as good as them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And when I went to white school, school, I always say this, I went to school white people, yo, Seth, <laughs> that, little, <laughs> that little motherfucker Seth, this motherfucker was doing his eyelids, right? We in eighth grade, you know you turn your eyelids inside out? <laughs> Fam, we stopped doing that shit in third grade. <laughs> Like this, y'all y'all laughing, but that mean that mean, this mean the world to me. Like, but my mama's whole thing was key. When you get in there, you gotta be more excellent. But I'm like, mama, they turn in their eyelids. You know? <laughs> like, they got the freshest library. They got all of this shit, and we up in there. You know, they, we up in there throwing words back and forth, playing vocabulary games and shit. And these motherfuckers just like laughing their ass off, like turning their. And I really do think, I don't like to fucking land on metaphor, but that's sort of a metaphor for, not you, but like white boys in this country, you know what I'm saying? Like we over here doing some shit, they turning their eyelids inside out, and next thing you know, they governor, you know? <laughs> or president. And so like, my whole shit is like, that excellent shit, yo, okay. I, but I wanna be, I want to accept my black abundance, and I want to, I want to accept my black abundance and I want to do everything I can to encourage young black children in my state to be free, which means when they fuck up, we have to forgive them. Mm -hmm. That shit is the hardest thing in this nation. Mm -hmm. That means you gotta forgive them. Mm -hmm. That means you gotta give motherfuckers second and third and fourth and fifth chances. And if you don't think, and it, yeah, I, I'm gonna keep preaching. So anyway, but that, that's, what I, that's what I think. I, Nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> but that's what I that's what I think. So so excellence, I understand when my mama pushed it. <clears throat> she comes from that civil rights era. Um, and then and then and I was born into a black power era. But I just think in my in, in my estimation, you know, like my mama would want wouldn't want me up here wearing this fresh ass shirt, the Samson May. She wouldn't want me up here in my sweats. But like, you know, we gotta be critical of ourselves, but we also gotta be honest about ourselves. You know what I'm saying? I've been writing for a minute. You know what I'm saying? I did not just become that nigga. Like, I've been that nigga in my heart mm -hmm. in terms of, like, the writing of, that I do. And so, like, I just got to tell my mama who everybody else. I'm not finna, like, get up on this motherfucking, like, wear a goddamn suit for you. I'm sure y'all beautiful people if I could see you. But for some, <laughs> no, I'm going to come up here and be honest and talk to you. And to me, that is a freedom that I feel like I wish every black person mm -hmm. in this world could have. And they do not. So we got we to gotta, we gotta do what we can to make that more possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, So last question for me as I encourage you who we can't really see to start thinking about questions you might ask. And it's a question about, uh, about DeAndre Brown, a guy you knew who hmm. thought he was going to make it to the yeah. NBA, even though all the signs were that it was not going to happen. And what you say towards the end of that essay is, uh, his NBA dreaming somehow inspired you to move back to Mississippi where you do your most courageous dreaming and witnessing. Yeah. And I just want to ask you, the last question I want to ask is, how do you, what does it mean to do your most courageous dreaming and witnessing? Yeah, that's a great question. At the time, it just meant I needed to finish heavy. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't finish heavy in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, this this kid I used to uh, kid he's a grown ass man now but this this slightly younger fellow than me who <laughs> used to play uh, he played professional basketball all across the world and he was talking to me I had inter interviewing for this essay for uh, ESPN and he was talking to me about um, it was wild because he had so many passports in his passports. He has so many, see, man, he has so many stamps in his passport. Mm -hmm. I don't have no stamps, so that's why I'm like, passport stamps. I was with you. I was with yeah, you. I, I saw I'm all scared the of flying, so. But, but DeAndre was like, you know, he came from no money. He, was, he wasn't a success necessarily, but he was the best basketball player we knew in Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. And then he went to play for, you know, virtually nothing all across the world. And, 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 and then I talked to my coach, I was talking about last, yes, uh, back there, uh, Satch, and I asked Satch, I was like, Satch, what would you say to DeAndre? And he was like, DeAndre gotta make a decision. Like, you know, he's, he's like, the dream is past him. He's never gonna make it to the pros. But DeAndre was like, 
okay, I'm not going to make it to the pros, but I'm going to keep dreaming my dream. And, and those dreams are going to take me to different places in this country, going to have different relationships. And so for me, listening to him talk about that really did inspire me to kind of just go back to Mississippi, um, partially because I couldn't finish heavy. Like, I was, I, was, I was trying as hard as I could to finish that book in New York, and it was just so bad. And so I just had to go home and get closer to the people that made me and the, and, and the, and the, and the atmosphere that made me. Mm -hmm. um, and DeAndre definitely encouraged me to do that, whether he knows that or well, he knows it now, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to turn on a light there's the light, and there's Ben Waterhouse, who did a lot to help get this event going. Thank you, Ben. Um, ben is actually going to play the heavy now a little bit uh, over there. If you have questions, um, you know, and I, I want to say something about questions for a minute, because I know sometimes people will get up and leave before questions, and everybody's free to do what they want to do. I will say, We've thought a lot organizationally about whether, for example, to ask people to write questions down and hand them up on pieces of paper. And uh, we're committed to the idea that uh, like the person asking is like even more important than the question. And that's why we've stuck with this format. And I want to just say that out loud. If you want to grab dinner because you want to grab dinner, I hope it's a good dinner. Uh, if you have a question that you want to Ask Kiese, um, the microphone is here. I just ask that you introduce yourself before the question. Usually it takes one to break the dam a little bit. Um, and while we're doing that, can I ask? Yeah, we have a question there. Do you want to ask from there instead of going up to the mic? Can you project and, and make it short enough that we can repeat it for people that can't hear? That's great. OK. Could y'all hear that? Yeah, thank you, thank you for, for saying that. Um, yeah, yeah. Repeat it. Um, what's your name? Esther. So Esther said that reading, ooh, it's so awkward to repeat this comment. <laughs> <laughs> Esther said about the person on stage whose book she read <laughs> that um, there was a description of of, 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 of a mother that, that felt just so tender and honest as a psychologist because the book was able to say that yes, you know, among other things, my mother, um, you know, sometimes beat me and whipped me and, um, and I was able to see and, and understand that, that my mother loved me. Um, and, I, and I was able to see and understand that she did not have to beat me to love me but I understood that. You didn't add that part, but so that's what, that was the comment. Right, it wasn't a good, right, right, right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm just saying thank you for seeing, for seeing that. Um, yeah, you put that book out in the world. The hardest thing in the world about that book is hoping that your craft has led people to believe and understand that, that you love your mama more than anything in the world. Mm. Yeah, so thank you for that. Thank you. So I really appreciate you being here because I don't never see no Southern black people here. Um, I'm originally from Montgomery. My family's from Demopolis and uh, Union Springs. And so I remember you talking a little bit about home. And so I've been here for about seven years. And so we have this thing in Montgomery, like once you leave, you can't come back. Mm. And it's one of those things because like you leave and they're proud of you, but then you come back and now you think, or they think that you think that you're better than them. Right. So having that sense of home, you feel displaced. You feel as if like, you know, where are you supposed to be, right? Yeah. 
And I felt like that as soon as I went to Jackson State. And that was oh. <laughs> that was five hours away, right? Because wow. we went to college. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, well, I got to leave here too because, like, job opportunities, money, and all of that stuff. And so once I got, like, my doctorate, I was like, I'm going back to the South to, like, teach. So I just got done teaching at USM. And I was like, I got to give USM Southern Miss. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, I got to give something back because Alabama State don't ever hire nobody. So... <laughs> <laughs> Once I got there, I was teaching interdisciplinary studies, and it was taught, like, most of the people on the football team were taught, like, hey, this is a fly-by department. Right. And we were hired as a diversity cohort, and so they were like, you need to turn this entire department around. And when I got, like, some of the assignments, like, the writing was not good, mm. the comprehension was not good, because they were there just to be football players. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, you talked a little bit about failure, and I was like, I've failed them. Like, mm. we failed them. We. We. And so I just wanted to get, like, your thoughts a little bit more about, like, what does home mean when you leave and you try to come back and you feel like we failed them? Mm. I failed them. We failed them. Yeah, and I love that it's not I, your home I, anymore. I love That's that right. question. What's your name? T. All right, I love that question, fam. Um, I, it's really complicated, though, because, like, when I graduated, it took me six years to graduate college because I got kicked out of uh, Millsaps, and then I went to Jackson State, and then I went to Oberlin. And I remember when I graduated from Oberlin, uh, anybody who's graduated from any sort of place, you, pro you, you probably know this feeling. And you know, the whole, my whole family was making it about me, and the whole school is making it about me. Four years, really, was six years for me, but I was like, okay, four years. <laughs> but like, I remember when I saw my mama face, I saw six years right here. Hmm. I saw six years right here. I heard six years when she opened her mouth. And when I went home, I saw six years on, like, you know, this notion you go home and people on the corner on the same corner. Yeah, but if you go and listen to those people, the stories ain't gonna be the same stories that they told six years ago. Six years is six years for home. And so the thing that I had to understand more than anything was like, if you go home, yeah, you coming home with some letters and shit behind your name. And you know where we've come from, they gonna people, our people gonna be like, yes. But I also think we owe it to our people to like use some of these skills that we have gathered at these institutions, which is hopefully the, the skill of questioning and asking, not in sort of like a, a way to dictate, but just to be like, where have you been? Where have you been? That's the question I think we gotta ask when we go home. And I also noticed when I came home to Mississippi this last time, the thing that thankfully I was old enough to understand was like, yeah, you can come home and be like, yo, I wanna start this organization. I wanna come home and start this, but the most, important generative work is asking people on the ground, at your home, in your home, how you can be a service. And I feel like that is some way that you, you, you sort of like step across that, that, that like gulf between like those who leave and those who stay. But we have to first understand that whether you stay or you leave, you have whatever, six years, four years, five years, 10 years of experience that's worth mining. Because one of the things about being in college is you have people ask you questions about yourself all the time. But I think one of the things that I will say about my people is that like they didn't have a lot of people to ask them questions. And if you don't ask the people who made home home about who they are and what they are, I think you're not gonna really have an understanding of home. So that's what I would say to that. And I really appreciate you giving what you just gave to us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, Kiese. My name is Kenia Davis. Hey. Uh, I think I, I connected with you via Instagram a few yeah. few years ago, but I wanted to just kind of give you your flowers right now, bruh. Like, you were actually one of the reasons why I ended up going to uh, grad school. So I'm three weeks, I, I, I just, I'm talking straight to you. I'm three <laughs> weeks out, you know what I'm saying, from getting oh. my MBA, so I just want to say thank you, bruh. You actually make, you actually make reading a, like a good thing. Like, that shit's lit. That's reading. <laughs> She, you made me want to be a writer. Remember, I tapped in. It was like, yo, I'm trying to be a writer. What yes. I do? You hit me back. I appreciate that. That's bad love, bro. So I just want to give you flowers, bro. Like, I'm just glad you're in my city. I'm originally from Oakland, but like, I'm, I work here at Nike, but so I'm here. This is my city now. You feel me? That mean everything that you could say. This your city. Say less, bro. S yes. Say it. Keep saying. Say more, mother. I got say you. It more. Yes. I got but my guy, even if you was anywhere else, bro, I told you, like, bro, wherever you at, I'm gonna come. Like, I feel you. so I'm glad you came to me. So that means a lot to me, bro. Like, for real, for real. Yeah. Like, like seriously, like, yeah. I feel like 
think my partners, we laugh about it, but black excellence, bro, that's just a thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a beautiful thing to me, bro. So, you know what I'm saying? So, I, I love you. I appreciate you, bro. Wherever you at, I'm going to be, man. So, thank you for coming to my city. I love city. you, too. And in three weeks, knock them three weeks out. That ain't shit. All right. <laughs> What up, fam? How are you? I met you at ALA. I remember. We, yes! Yeah. I love you, bro. Yeah, so I, was like, I, was, I was like, we know each other. First of all, my friend Aisha, who also, when we bum rush you at the stage, she said, what's up? She loves you. <laughs> she has already let her partner know that um, just in case you are ever available, she, he can be pushed to the side at any time. So. I feel like you need to remember this shit on tape, though. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead, though. <laughs> so somebody might be a little disappointed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, people I, shoot these days, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, because I've been reading um, a little bit of Bell Hooks, and I just read for the first time um, Home Place. Um, and, you know, what I think is... Um, what I think is most important takeaway from that is that like she uh, told us that home home place is this place where healing happens. Yeah. And so I want to also understand like where you see, do you see Mississippi as this place where you, when you go home, mm -hmm. you also are oh. healed? Um, also, me and my friend are getting a tattoo of Black Abundance. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that was so good. I, I, you know, when somebody, when somebody bring it down, you want to make sure you say something that's like upbeat. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't. I mean, um, I, I, I think places of healing can sometimes not be places of healing, and places that are not places of healing can sometimes. Be be places of healing. So, so I did think when you said that, like right now, Mississippi is, um, I ain't gonna lie, it's like it's not a place of healing for me, like, like, like physical space being in, being in it, because we fighting right now. I mean, I mean, I, I could go down the list of shit that's happening in my state right now. Um, uh, you know, Jackson's 85% black, this all white fucking Republican run, whatever, just established it, like their own police force in my city. It's all, you know, like the all white group of people establish a police force. Like that's apartheid, like in the city. So I'm not trying to say, I'm trying to let those people dictate my healing, but you know, right now, today, Mississippi is, it's hard to, it's hard to heal up, up in, in there. And real talk, when, when, you, when you have mobility like this, you know, Kendrick, I think, did this ad nauseum, you can start to feel that sort of, and they, they call it survivor's guilt, but, um, I want to make Mississippi a place a place of healing, but I think sometimes it has to start with you being honest about like how I don't know. I mean, I left because I didn't know how to heal. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't know how to take disrespect. Oh, like my, if you disrespect me too much, I want to fight. You know what I mean? Like I can't fight no more. My hips fucked up. You know? But I can pay people who know how to fight in Mississippi. <laughs> Real. I, but but that's not. But you see what I'm saying? When you're talking like that, you probably need to leave. You know? So that's the truth. So thank you for that. Hi. Hi, my name is uh, Midnight Abioto, and I am a poet, uh, and I'm from Mississippi. Um, what part? Greenville. Green. Oh, the Delta. Greenville. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I know all about that brown water that you're no. talking about. I grew up with it, but I think my my question is a comment wrapped into a, uh, a question wrapped into a comment about Mississippi not being a place outside of myself, but a presence inside of myself. And so when I think about what has historically happened in Mississippi and what continues to happen in Mississippi and the resilience of the people there, uh, the ability to keep coming forward despite this overwhelming oppression I feel like there is a building of a revolution that is going to flip. Absolutely. Uh, that is going to flip. I don't know when. It's, yeah. not, it's certainly not going to be in my lifetime. Right. But so when you talk about 
uh, let me say this. I didn't even know who you were. Good. Okay. <laughs> and when I got the, uh, uh, the, the email to come, I said, well, let me go. And then I looked up your name, not what you had written, and I looked at who you were. I said, well, let me go see what you have to offer me uh, and in this stage in my life. And so what you have offered me is this way of breaking apart ideas um, of beingness yeah. and looking at it in a new vantage mm. point. Uh, I miss Mississippi here in Oregon desperately, but I know that y'all got some problems and it is only because of my resilience of coming from Mississippi. I practiced law for 40 years. Yes. And so I know y'all got some serious, oppressive, racial issues that you cover up with your kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. I'm just, I'm saying, yeah. It's so yeah. good. So <laughs> you gave me so much, I don't even know how to frame the question, actually. But when you say that you can't come back to Mississippi and you say that you use your pen to, um, d to help right. Mississippi, um, it's like I feel like all of what you said is just swirling in my head, right. changing the DNA in a way. And can I just tell you what you said that changed my DNA? Mm -hmm. Or, or reaff uh, uh, reaffirmed my DNA. I know you from Mississippi because what you just said was you, you talking about faith, that Mississippi faith. Like mm -hmm. when you like we like revolution, we you know we will win. Mm -hmm. I don't like to put it in those kind of categories. But every person that I know know from Mississippi has absolute faith that that is true. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is, every person I know from Mississippi has always said since my grandmother was born, 1929. I don't think it's gonna happen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think it's gonna happen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. But to have that sort of faith in the face of so many wins and so many like bloody losses, I think is the best of what our home has to offer the world, mm -hmm. including Portland. So I just want to say thank you for everything you've given Portland. Thank you for what you just gave to us too. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I think. I don't see other people stacked up there, and I think. Uh, oh, okay. Let's go. Let's call this. Let's call this last question, and then yeah, please. All right. So I'm a future teacher. I'm gonna start my first year teaching next year, and thank you. <laughs> and um, and I was thinking when you were talking about like the experimenting as a young black person and how important that is. I think that's like super important. And one thing that I wanna do is make sure that my black students know that they can do whatever the hell they want to. And I think about, you know, Seattle Public Schools has this thing, this curriculum where it's Black Lives Matter in school week, where they were like, it's not required, I don't think, but they have you teach these lessons about the Black Lives Matter movement and where it came from and all this stuff. And I taught it, and to me it was like, it was really about teaching white kids about the Black Lives Matter movement rather than having anything to do with like the black kids because they already know and they've already seen it and they've already been triggered by it and harmed mm. by it. And so to me, it felt like it's my question is more about like, how can we have that both? Like, how can I have inspire these young black kids? And I just don't want them to constantly be seeing themselves in those positions in the like Black Lives Matter movement and stuff like that. Yeah. And they try and put a spin on it where it's like, you know, this is a group of people that always stand up for themselves. And I understand, like, you want to make sure that people know that there's some power in this. But I just know that from my standpoint, I don't always want my students to see themselves like that. I want them to know that experimenting and doing all this stuff is important. Right. So I just want to know your opinion about, like, as black teachers, our role in putting those two together. Where we're being honest and we're supporting the learning of white kids and not black mm -hmm. kids, but we're also not just showing black kids this side of the history and right. also inspiring them. Like, how can we put, do those together as black teachers of black students? Uh, 
Yeah, that's that's. Uh... Okay, so I, I th first of all, I, I I think you might know the answer more than anybody in this room, just based on that the way you asked that question. Um, <laughs> but I'm gonna like I'll say a little something. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the little something I have to say, I think, asks too much of you. You know what I mean? I I think I think what you are sitting in is is the responsibility that you have to teach your students but also to teach individual students and then to teach different groups of students. Mm -hmm. That's four jobs. Mm -hmm. When you're being paid half as much as what you should for one. Yeah. So, so I think organizing to, 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 to be compensated more fairly is part of what we're talking about. And, 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 and while one is organizing to be more fairly paid, and this is the part I think is kind of like controversial about what I'm saying, I think you kind of got to max out in that time you have, meaning I think you have to give everything you can to those students in front of you right now with the probability that your ass is going to burn out in five years from doing that. Yeah. And I think other people would say, do it the other way, right? Pace yourself. You got to be there for long, more people in the long run. I think that is absolutely true, but I also think that the students in front of you today, sadly, because premature death are not guaranteed a five year, 10 year down the line type of thing. We, as black folks, are not guaranteed to be here five, 10 years from now. So I just think you give everything you can to teaching those students in that classroom, but also I just think you gotta do, I think it's not fair what I'm saying, but I think you have to teach those kids, whether it's in like caucusing or, or, or what the people call affinity groups, but I would just say office, like you have to meet with those black kids and talk and ask them what they need mm -hmm. and try to give everything you can to them, knowing that what you are giving them is actually tools that are, are gonna be used to subvert the system because if the system wanted you to do that work, they would pay you accordingly. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to fucking educate them black kids. Mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck. I don't have to live in Portland to know that. If they wanted you to educate those black kids affirmatively, wholly, heal, like with healing at the center and, 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 and radical experimentation, as part of what they did, you, 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 you wouldn't even have to ask that question. Mm -hmm. But you do got to ask that question, and I think you do got to tend to those kids, no matter what, but most, most importantly, as importantly, I think you have to organize with other people trying to do this work so you can get more resources to be what you can be to those students. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, A couple of little, a couple of little points of business before a little thanks. The business is if you're uh, watching this online in just a couple minutes, I'd encourage you to click that Zoom link uh, in the YouTube comments so you can join a follow-up conversation facilitated by Oregon Humanities Roselle Medina to keep digging deeper into what Kies is getting us thinking about. Uh, in here. Yes, he's going to be making his way over to sign three books, not three books, many copies of the three books. I don't want to incite, you know, trouble. Um, that's going to be over there, and so I just want to ask if we can, like, be a little patient for a few minutes, because he's been up here for a good amount of time. Um, there is, there are a couple people here from the Regional Arts and Culture Council, from RAC, and they're trying to do some evaluation of events like this. And they're also by the door, it's a very short survey. And so I am making a plug for stopping by and picking up one of the surveys. It'll help us know uh, what events are meaningful to you and why. Uh, on events, I guess I wanna say, Oregon Humanities trying to do stuff like this around the state, sometimes in big groups with people on stages, more often, in smaller groups where people are sitting in a circle and everybody can see each other. And we're trying to talk about a lot of the same difficult stuff. We're trying to talk about it honestly and tenderly. And uh, I hope you'll show up and try some of these and help lead some of these down the road. So please, please uh, stay involved or get involved if you haven't. When you're up there getting your book signed, I wanna ask that you not go in for hugs for COVID reasons. That's just a request that, like, we try to respect the table and the space. It's already crowded. So um, last thing I want to say, aside from thanking all of you for coming out, is I just want to say a really huge thank you for everything you brought tonight and everything you bring to the world. So thank you. Thank you, for real. Thank y'all. Thank you.